So we're about to get started for our last session of the day. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Kathy Whiffen. I'm manager of prevention services and uh, very pleased to have such a large group out to join us today for this event. Uh, great to see the interest in health and safety and making our workplaces safer. So our final session of the day is turning insight into impact and it's being presented by Jess Chapman. Um, Jess is a little bit about Jess. Jess is from Britain and moved to St. John's in 2007 with a background in HR, organizational performance, learning and development, and training in neuroscience, and over a decade of experience working in different countries, a variety of industries, and with some of the largest organizations in the world. Jess has a unique combination of skills and experience that's hard to beat. Known for her ability to read minds, so I would caution you about what you're thinking about for the rest of the afternoon, she delivers a creative yet practical solutions. Jess holds a degree in European business and French from Nottingham Trent University in the UK and certifications in neural leadership, international sales and marketing. And I'm sure you're kind of thinking, okay, it's a strange fit for a, sale, uh, for a health and safety conference, but Jess is gonna bring it all together for us today and help you take away some of the information that you've learned. So I give you Jess Chapman. Thanks. Thank you very much, Kathy. Yes, uh, I am a Brit. Don't hold it against me. Uh, you'll notice very quickly I'm a Brit. I like to say I have graduated from being a CFA to an MBC, so I'm no longer a come from away. I am a Newfoundlander by choice. I married a Newfoundlander. I have kids. I'm not leaving anytime soon. Um, I get applause for that one. That's great. That's early days for applause. Um, now, very occasionally, being British, I say things that don't make sense to people in Newfoundland and Canada, much less in Newfoundland than the rest of Canada. Uh, but very occasionally, I'll use a TV phrase or a slang word, and everybody looks at me like I've got four heads. So if that happens at some point this afternoon, there's plenty of folks in the room who know me. Someone just yell at me, and I will endeavor to change my language up. Right? So yes, what are we talking about today? Why me? Well, so. I am British, I have been doing wonderful world of people stuff for most of my career. I run a company called E3, we are based here in the Avalon Peninsula, we do work across North America and we help organisations with all things to do with people and culture in the workplace, which for me is very relevant when you're talking about safety, because you're trying to get people to do things differently and that's where neuroscience comes in. Most of what gets in our way is our brain. Now unfortunately, everybody has one. Right? So our ability to understand what affects people, think about how we take action, how we drive action, how we pay attention to people's brains helps us if we're going to change culture and drive safety behaviours at work. So that's kind of the fit for today. And when we were talking about this session in particular, um, the team were like, do you, would you do a session? I was like, yes. Um, I'm very glad they gave you cake because that made you all stay, so thank you for the cake. Um, but really what I want to talk about this afternoon to wrap up the day is so what? We've had an absolutely fantastic day. Like the sessions today I thought were excellent. So if we could have a round of applause to the Workplace NL team and all the presenters, that would be great. So I thoroughly enjoyed everything I sat through today. But one of the things I'm really passionate about is that when you ask people, if I ask you to tomorrow, how was the conference yesterday? that you don't say, it was great, I had fantastic chicken. Okay. What I want you to be talking about is, what did you take away from today? What are you gonna turn into action? What are you gonna apply in your organization in order to make a difference? And how do we ensure that everybody in our organizations feel like they can make a difference? Because I spend a lot of time talking to employees and frontline leaders who don't always know that their role is just as important as the people at the top. And when it comes to culture, it really is. So in terms of this afternoon, we've only got 45 minutes, so I'm not gonna do all the talking. But I'm gonna talk about the importance of leadership, and I have leadership in inverted commas for a reason. And then I'm gonna get you talking, and I'm gonna get you talking about today, what you're taking away from today, and what you wanna do with today. And then we're gonna talk a little bit about, if it's so easy to determine action, how come it's so hard to get people to do it? Right? What is it about our brains that gets in the way, and how can we think about some of those things when we go back to work? Right? So that is the plan. 
we've got time, I'll take questions. If not, my contact information is on the last slide. By all means, reach out to me after today. I'm always happy to talk about the weird and wonderful things that people do. Right. Now, I'm big on interaction, so I'm going to be peppering you with pop quiz questions throughout 45 minutes just to keep you awake. And we are going to do a couple of things that will require you to scribble on paper. So you might want to get a pen handy if you don't have one right in front of you right now. So let's talk about importance of leadership. If we're talking about impact and we're talking about culture, I don't think we can have a conversation without talking about leadership. And I would guess there's probably nobody in this room that doesn't understand the role that leadership plays when we're talking about culture and engagement. But I have a question for you. What percentage of workplace safety influ incidents are influenced by either communication failures or leadership behaviors? A, B, C, or D, what do you reckon? C, D, D, we've got a B over there. No one's going for A, that's good. No. It is, in fact, D, 70%. Right. Now, I could, I think that's a surprise to many people in this room. We were certainly on the higher end of the scores for sure. And I could rattle off a whole ton of statistics for you that clearly tie leadership to culture and impact. One of them is that we know positive leadership behavior reduces safety incidents by somewhere between 20 to 40 percent. The Hay Group did a piece of research that looked at culture in organizations. Did you know that the results of your organization, including your safety record, can be directly tied back to 30 percent of the variance is tied back to your culture, directly related to the culture of the organization? Not your strategy, not your planning, not your processes, but the culture. And up to 50 to 70% of that culture is tied to leadership behavior. So we can't have a conversation about impact, culture, safety without talking about leadership. But we've been talking about leadership for a while now. So why are we still talking about it? Why are my people like me still up there giving you statistics? Why are we still writing reports about it? Why is it we haven't got this nailed and not Everybody's seen your leadership team are bang on the money and doing everything they, they should be doing. Anybody got an answer? <laughs> it's changed, yes. The, the human factor, yes. It's, it's brain related. All these things are brain related. Right? So when you think about leadership, your senior leadership teams, they know that some of you are going to be here. Some of you are senior leaders in the room. You know what you're supposed to be doing. <clears throat> but you have 472 other things also going on in your brains at the same time. And I had a conversation with somebody at lunchtime who said, I just, I just want my senior leaders to be more active. I just want them to be more active and, and do things a little bit differently in the way that they lead. But here's the rub. The research says that when it talks about leading things like cultural change, only 15% of senior leaders know exactly what they're supposed to do. So 85% have some idea, right? But only 15% are completely clear on what it is you want from them, I want from them, everybody else wants from them. <clears throat> so if not spelling it out, we're not gonna have change. So it's not, I don't think that it's not that our senior leadership teams aren't aware, I think they're totally aware, I think they're totally bought in. But they need our help to drive those messages home. So I don't want us to stop talking about the role of leadership because I think that's really important. But I think maybe we need to have that conversation a little bit differently around what sponsoring change and culture actually looks like rather than assuming they know how to do it. And the other piece that I don't want us to miss when we're talking about leadership is that leadership is not a position. So when we're talking about safety culture or any facet of culture whatsoever, every single person in this room and every single person in your organization can change your culture. Now that is not what some people say to me. I have a lot of conversations with frontline employees who say, well, what do you want me to do? I'm just one person. You need to talk to the CEO and get them to change things. And what we're missing out on when we do that is the power of peer. When it comes to your brain, you are actually more likely to pay attention to your friend Bob and what Bob is doing than what your boss tells you to do. 
Some of you are laughing about that. Maybe you have a friend, Bob, I don't know. Maybe, there's, I've, maybe, maybe I've met your Bob, right? So we're underestimating the power that we have in the people around us when we're thinking about driving culture. So 65% of employees are more likely to adopt safe and ethical behaviors when they are modeled by colleagues or informal leaders, not just senior leaders. So an informal leader is a person that displays leadership behavior without formally awarded role or position. So are you making use of those informal leaders? How do you tap into those people? Are you bringing them in when you do your change planning? Are you thinking about their headspace? Are you getting them to have the mindset that you want? Are you getting them to role model? Maybe you are, brilliant. But I constantly see change plans and organizations that are top down driven where the frontline leader and the informal leader get find out about stuff exactly the same time as the rest of the employee base. And then we're missing a trick. Right? So how can you leverage your informal leaders better in your organization? Another quiz question for you. How much more likely are employees to report safety issues if they see at least one coworker consistently speaking up? I've given you two C's there just to confuse you. <laughs> see if anyone was awake this afternoon. Is it C1 or C2? That is the question. Someone's gone for D, some of, you, some of you have gone for C and you're hedging your bets because you've got a 50-50 chance now if you pick C, it's very clever. It is 50%, right. 50% more likely because I see my friend Bob putting his hand up and having those conversations. So again, how are we fostering and encouraging those people and you all know who they are. You could point to them for me tomorrow. So who are they and how are you bringing them in to the way that you do things? How are you encouraging them to help you with the lift and the effort that you have in creating the culture that you want to create? Last one. Consistent role modeling at all levels has a ripple effect where teams are 23% more likely to proactively support safety initiatives. So I am not saying, and I will never say, don't talk to your leadership team. They need to role model from the top. Everybody looks up, they wanna see what the top is doing. But if we're also not thinking about our impact, every single person in this room can role model, every single person in this room can carry a leadership mindset back, can talk safety culture. And if you do it, then you are Bob. Right? And everybody will look at you and go, well, if you can do it, maybe I can do it too. And that is another way of creating change and culture in organizations. So, I like this quote. If you think you're too small to make a difference, you haven't spent a night with a mosquito. Now, please don't go back to work and say, we had a presenter who told us to be annoying and bite people. That is not what I am aiming for. Right? But I think there are still lots of people in organizations who do not understand the power that they have and think that just because they are one person in an organization, they cannot affect change and culture. So this group, I know a lot of people who work in HFC. Generally speaking, pretty sure most of you are comfortable and confident in your influencing skills. How do you bring some of the other folks along with you on that journey? So something to think about. So that's fine, great. We all believe we have power. We can all be Bob. But what does that mean we're actually going to do? How do we go about influencing and making change in organizations? Now, we could spend weeks talking about planning and other things, but for me, it comes down to two relatively straightforward things. Insight and action. If you take action without ever having new insight, you are going to keep doing all the same things you've been doing before, which is perfectly fine if you want to maintain. But if you're trying to change anything in your organization, then action on its own is not enough. We need insight. But if you only have insight with no action, then what happens? You have tons of insight, but no action. What happens? Nothing. We have some really good conversations where everybody goes away super energized and nothing changes in the organization. So we need to have both. Right? But in order to understand both, we also understand a little bit about the brain. So when we're thinking about insight, insight's an interesting thing. We have had a day today packed full of insight. You have been to great sessions, listened to speakers, talked to your coworkers, met people you haven't seen in ages. I've met people I haven't seen in like five years today. Brilliant that your brain is now full. And the way that our brains work is in order for you to remember stuff, 
the neurons in your brain have to fire together. Right? We have to create connections. Because if you don't create a connection, your brain goes, eh, and it's gone. So if we don't do anything based on today, when you leave, by tomorrow, you will only remember between 10 and 20% of what you learned today. It's gone. Right? So we need to create some ways for your brain to make those connections. The other thing to remember that's interesting about insight, it's a bit like a candle burning in a very bright room. So if we had this room with all the lights on and there was a tiny candle burning down in the corner, most of us wouldn't even notice that candle. Right? Insight is exactly the same in your brain. When you have a new idea or a new insight, it's two connections in your brain firing together for the first time. And they make a little fizz, right? a little bit of fizzing energy. And you get a little bit of a spark. But if your brain is filled with all of the things you need to do today, and you are running full tilt and delivering on your to-do list, then your brain goes, yeah, that's interesting, but I haven't got time for that. Puts it over there. So if we actually want to have insights, we need to create space. We need to create time and space, and we need to find ways for our brains to spot the insights that we have going on in our head. And the simplest way to do both of those things is to talk. If you talk to somebody about a topic, you actually increase your recall of that topic to between 50 and 70%. And if you force your brain to talk about a topic, you force your brain to connect and understand that topic. Who here has been in a conversation with someone and someone has said to them, can you explain that to me? And you've started and then you've gone, actually, no, I can't. Right? That happened to anyone? Happens to me a lot. Right? That's because you don't actually understand, but you don't know you don't understand until you have to try and explain and articulate to somebody else. The process of explaining makes us make those connections in our brains. Right? So I'm going to get you to do that, to think about today. I'm going to give you 10 minutes. By all means, get up. Please don't feel like you've got to sit at your chairs. You've been sitting in your chairs all day. Talk to people on different tables. I'm going to give you 10 minutes. And all I want you to do is talk to each other. But I do want you to talk to each other about today. Please don't talk to each other about hurricanes or hockey or anything else. Right? What are you taking away from today? What is sticking with you? What is burning in your brain? It doesn't have to be tangible or concrete. Just talk about what's sticking with you. Right? And I'll give you a time check when we're coming close to the end. Ten minutes. Here we go. Our departments don't talk to each other, and there was, you know, people presenting today who work in my organization who were doing things that pertain to my work that I had no idea about. And so my takeaway from this, well, I've already done it. I've emailed the person already. So <laughs> Perfect. Actions you can do right now are really good actions. Uh, one of the biases in our brains, so back to unconscious bias, we have more than 150 different types of bias in your brain, one of which is distance bias, which means that you will talk to the people who are next to you way before you talk to anybody else, and the further away they get, the less likely you are to talk to them. So you only need to be down a floor or across the corridor, let alone in another building or another region or another province, you're probably not going to hear from somebody unless you make a point of going asking the questions. So think about your supply chain in your organization, how things work, who's downwind from you, who's upwind from you, when do you talk to those people? Because what they're doing is going to affect you, but they won't necessarily think about you. And that's not because they don't care. It's just because of how our brains work. Awesome. Any other insights anyone's willing to share? Oh, you're all being secret, secretive. That's fine, as long as you take them away and you do something with them. So that's the second part of this. So we've got insights, lovely. Probably more than you've put down on paper, so I'd encourage you to ponder a little later tonight. We now need to figure out action. But unlike insights, actions have to be different in our brains. How many people here procrastinate? If you don't have your hand up, you're lying. Right? <laughs> so, our brains, in order to do things, our brains determine priority order of things. And if something is too big and too complicated, even if it's really important, your brain will basically go, yeah, 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 but I'm going to put that over there and come back to it when I'm less busy. When are any of us less busy? So what happens is we put it off. So anytime you want to 
do something. We talk about eating the elephant in pieces. Totally true in your brain. You've got to break your actions down into really small, tangible things. So we talk about actions that you can take within a week. So emailing my colleagues to set up a meeting to talk about what they're doing, great. Very specific action that I can take within a week. And then the second thing is write it down. Research shows if you write down your action, you are one and a half times to three times more likely to do it than if you just think about it in your head. Don't ask me why, we don't actually know why, we just know it works. And then, if you tell your friend Bob this is what you've committed to doing, you're five times more likely to do it because Bob's going to ask you if you did it. Right? Peer pressure is a wonderful thing. So, I want you to write down, pick something, what is one thing that you can go away and do next week that will influence the safety culture at your workplace. Right? Be specific. Don't be like, I'm going to go back and talk better to everybody. That's not enough. Right? Be really specific. I'm going to talk to this person at this time about this. I'm going to focus on this. I'm going to go back and I'm going to write our next e-blast to demystify the terminology of DE&I. Because we use a lot of words in DEI that I think a lot of people don't understand. So my action is I'm going to do something with that next week. Right? So what is one action that you can take in the next week? I'm going to give you five minutes to do that. Okay, so there's some great actions being contemplated, and some of you are whole teams, which is like you can triple the impact of your action by all focusing on the same thing. Uh, somebody was asking me about um, how do we get people to see themselves in this? And one of the things we talk about a lot in my world is um, if you do this stuff every day, it's like me and people stuff. Uh, this, this is important to me, so my brain knows it's important. So my brain looks for it everywhere. Right? It's like when you decide to buy a new car. When you start deciding what car you want, you start seeing that car everywhere you go. Right? That's because you've told your brain it's important. For you in this room, HSE is important. For everybody else in your organization, it is not as important. It's not that they don't care. It's not that they're not bought in, but their brain has a different priority. So you've got to talk about it all the time. And I know you do, um, but it takes five to seven times of telling somebody something before they hear you. Not understand, not care, not agree, not do what you want, just start to clock that you're talking about something. So about the time that you're sick to death of talking about something is the time someone will say, oh, are we doing that? And you think, how do you not know? That is because their brain has a different priority. So you can't stop banging the drum, right? Can't stop banging the drum. Anyone got an action they're particularly proud of they want to share? Something that they think is like this? Don't make a difference. You're all sure, like, no, it's four o'clock, Jess. You want to go have some coffee and cake and go down. So what I say to you is great actions are not big actions. Great actions are small actions that move you along. Right? So make, have a look at your actions. And if you haven't come up with something today, that's fine. But if you want to take actions and move things along, small things you can do in a week and then continue, much better than saying, we're going to fundamentally change our culture or we're going to do this, because it won't happen. Everybody's brains are too busy and too big. So the last thing I wanted to touch on today is kind of everybody else. So this is great. We had really good insights. A lot of you have got actions. So how come we can't just do this and change culture? How come we can't just get everyone to go to a symposium, write down an action, and then at the end of the day, we've moved everything forwards? Well, because unfortunately, everyone has a brain. So we could spend quite a lot of time on buy-in. When we do change management training and other things, we spend a long time on why people are resistant to change. But there's two things that I'm going to talk about today that are helpful and I think quicker to talk about. Uh, so if you ask anybody in an organization, would you like to work in an engaged, safe, and healthy organization, everyone goes, yes, please, if someone else can do it. So anytime we ask people to change, we are dealing with a phenomenon in the brain, which is around habit. So we're going to demonstrate this now. My Workplace NL folks who've been on programs with me, you've done this, but do it again for me. That would be great. So you've got paper on your tables, you've got a little handout. Grab your pen, and on your handout, there's a spice for signature. I would like you to just sign your name in one of the spots for signature for me. Just go ahead and sign your name. Or in your workbook, that's fine, in your notebook, wherever. Just sign your name like you normally would. 
What's that? <laughs> no, I'm not keeping your signatures. I'm not taking them away. I will not put them on checks. You're all fine. It's good. All right. And when you've signed your name, I want you to put the pen in the other hand and then sign your name again in the other slot. Usually takes a bit longer the second time. All right. How did it feel the first time? Normal, easy, probably quite quick, but I didn't think about it. What about the second time? Awkward, I had to think about it, difficult, right? That is an example of how your brain works. You were not born signing your name. You have just done it so many times that you don't think about it anymore. Who thinks about how to clean their teeth? Occasionally. We might do occasionally. But for the most part, I like thinking about other things. Who has driven to work and pulled into the car park and doesn't remember how they got there? Like you're kind of on autopilot. Our brains are desired to create habits out of everything that we do. Um, and so you have a giant staples easy button in your head. Your brain wants to do the minimum amount of work possible. And so when you do something a lot, your brain makes it a habit. And in safety, that's a problem because I'm doing my work on autopilot. And the longer I've been in the job, the more autopilot I have. So back to if you're not repetitive, intentional, and I think the lady who did the presentation first thing this morning has some very graphic images and things like that. That's that shock factor to get people's brains to come back to it. Right? So we have to break habit with people. We have to be in their faces to get them to think about habit. And then we have to get them to build new habits. So how long does it take someone to build a new habit? Hey, See? It, there's an adage it's A. I'm sorry, that's not true. It is C. It totally depends. It depends on how difficult it is, how motivated the person is, and so on. So the simplest thing I'm going to say to you in that score is we stop too soon. Whenever I work with organizations trying to drive change, we design the thing. There's a new process, new system, whatever. We put it out there and we go, ta-da, that'll be good, right? No. We've got to change habits. And it takes, I'd say on average, for me, the things I've seen, at least three to six months of consistently doing work with people for them to be okay with their new habit. Not necessarily competent, but okay. And the other piece you need, bottom of this, is reward. You just signed your name with your non-dominant hand, and most of you went, ugh. So think about that in the context of work. If I don't say thank you, for doing that, what will you do? You'll go back to doing it with your original hand because people aren't stupid, it's way easier. Of course I'm gonna go back to doing it that way. So if you want people to change in your organization, we have to be talking about it for quite a long time and we have to be saying thank you a lot, right? So don't be skimping those things. So that's the first thing. The second thing about the brain is how we are wired. So what is stronger in your brain, the pros of something or the cons of something? The cons, yes. So we are wired for threat first. Your brain is designed to avoid anything that might make you uncomfortable. So, and that means change of any kind. Right? So it is completely normal for people to resist change. It's completely normal for people to go there. The problem is that sometimes they're imagining things that aren't real. It doesn't matter if it's in their head. Their brain will tell them not to do it. If you're interested in learning more about resistance to change, I would encourage you to look at a model called SCARF. It's from the Neuroleadership Institute, and it looks at the buttons that go off in people's heads that affect their motivation level. Right? But what I want to focus on for the last few minutes today is foinking. That is a word you will not forget. As people foink all the time at work. And somebody said to me earlier, can you do that next to somebody? Oh yes, right? this is not an HR thing. Foinking is fear of imaginary negative consequences. No matter how good the culture or whatever you are proposing sounds, you will have someone who will have imagined the worst possible scenario about that situation, and their brain will be telling them, don't do it. So our job is to think about the foinkers. This is the one time you get permission to think about foinking. 
What are all the reasons someone is not going to want to do this? Get creative with it. Brainstorm all of the most ridiculous things that you think someone could think about with what you're trying to do, because I guarantee there's someone who has that in their head. Right? And then you need to talk about it with them right? and take it off the table. And sometimes you're going to be thinking, I can't believe you think that, or where did that come from? Or seriously, that's what you're worrying about? It doesn't matter. Because in their head, it's very big, and it's very real, and it will stop them from getting on board. So the more that you can encourage people to openly share their foinks, right? you share your own, and all those informal leaders that we were talking about are great people for this, because they're the ones who know. They know that Billy isn't happy. No, they know Susan's, what Susan's talking about. Susan and Billy aren't telling you. They're telling Bob. There's a few Bobs in the room, so you, know, you should be good. Right? So foinking. You've got to pay attention to foinking. So bang the drum, don't stop talking about things. You can't, because people do not have the same focus level you do. Be a role model. We've just seen the influence that peers can have. Talk to people about their foinking. Say thank you to reward the habit, and don't stop too soon. If you stop too soon, you're not going to get to the end game, and you're going to have to start all over again. Okay. So last piece, make a quick note for yourself. Oh, I can't go back this again. Quick note for yourself, of the things we just talked about in buy-in, is there something you're like, hmm, I could do a bit more on that. Maybe I could talk about winking. Maybe I could say thank you more. Is there something that you could do when you go back to work as of tomorrow that might encourage more buy-in? Make a note of that for two minutes, and then we will wrap up. What is your buy-in action? And tomorrow, when someone says, what did you talk about the comrades? You're going to be like, we talked about foinking. Oh, yeah. Okay. 20 more seconds to scribble your notes. OK. So thank you very much for staying with me this afternoon. It's for me. When we're talking about any kind of impact, when we're talking about culture, when we're talking about safety, we're talking about behavior. And leadership is really important, but leadership is not just the people at the top. It's everybody in our organization. How do we empower everybody in our organization to realize that they can role model and that they can be a leader in the things that we're doing? And they don't always have to just look up. Peer influencing is a massive part of how our brain functions. Social conformity is very loud. So use it to your advantage. The rumor mill will work for you or it will work against you. Right? So use those tools to your advantage. Action drives change. Right? So if you haven't put down an action here today, that's totally fine. Sometimes we have to think about things. But identify the small actions that you can take. And over time, it will add up to big change and great cultures. So thank you very much for staying for the last session of the afternoon. I really appreciate it. And if you have any questions, I'll be here.